Well, welcome guys, thanks for checking out this video. The Retro Pocket 3 is finally with us. I did pre-order this on day one of release, which is the August the 20th, and then took about two weeks to finally get to me. I did have some holdups because my PC decided to buckle about a few days ago, so I had to upgrade the hard drive, the RAM, and had to change the processor a bit. But now finally, I can jump in this video and cover this pretty awesome handheld. Now personally for this channel, I'm not affiliated or endorsed by this product at all. I just really enjoy the type of content that Retroid does bring for us. And I had some great support from you guys for my original video for the Retroid Pocket 2 and the Plus. So by all means, hit that like and subscribe button just helps up this channel and is much appreciated. And see what this brings to this quite popular, saturated, handheld retro gaming emulation market. Well, here we have it, very professionally boxed to ensure safety on delivery. We got some protective padding, which is nice. And every pre-order is stated that you do get some extra goodies, but every order should come with a 32 gigabyte SD card. So that is fresh, nothing on there. Then we got some different style of buttons that they did state they wanted to include originally, but now they give it for us to set up and install for ourselves, but they give us all the necessary tools to do so. So really not sure what these are, really have to look into it and perhaps I'll do another video later on about installing this. Hopefully they are just a plug and play, don't have much soldering skills. But this is a very nice designed box, it's a little bit bigger than the original and it does come across a very professional feel. Let's just slide this out and now we have it finally, nothing else in the box. But I'm going to keep that. We got a nice USB 3 tidy little cable. I would say a high quality type of cable, better than what you would get from anything like Poundland that we have here. Here is the user manual, which I'm sure I should spend more time in this, but I just really want to get into the product. But this has some good information and is useful. You should get into this before any steps further. So we got the shortcut buttons and useful information. And the disc come with a screen protector, which is a very nice touch. And here we have the first look in my hands. And wow, this is very different and it's very light. Lighter than I thought it would be. The build quality of this handheld does come across very professional. And those buttons are really easy to trigger, which is very nice and comfortable in the hand. Very smooth type of plastic, giving it a very clean feel. Very simplistic as well. And that D-pad is a new feature to Retroid Pocket and it's very comfortable. I would have to spend a bit more time with this in my hands to get a better verdict on the build quality, but so far I'm very impressed and a lot different to what I expected originally. My first impression of the button layout I didn't find quite comfortable, but later on it did grow me. We do have the home button there on the side, so we double click on that. There is a short travel to these buttons, so it's very easy to trigger, which is really nice. So it's not really hard on the hands for long term gaming. And that trigger is very comfortable. And on the side, we do have the volume dials. And I am speculating that they could be easily triggered if these are in your hand. But later on, I did find out I didn't accidentally trigger them at all. This does have a very smooth feel in the hand and it is very light. And finally, we do have that add stick, which should have been in the original Retro Pocket 2. Now let's quickly brush up on its specifications to see what to expect later on. It is packed with the same GPU as the original Retro Pocket 2 Plus, which I thought they would have brought something a bit more powerful, but it is a really good processor. And now we do have that 4.7 inch 16 by 9 touchscreen. So that is a great addition now to Retro because now we get some widescreen gaming on the go and have a decent video output to fill your entire widescreen. The resolution of the screen is 750 x 1334, so a nice jump up from the Retro Pocket 2. It does support 720p HDMI output, and you can select between two different models, a 2GB of RAM, D 
DDR4 or even a 3 gigabyte DDR4 and discharge of that extra 10 pounds. So I do advise getting that 3 gigabytes model so we can push some extra emulation perhaps or even just get more of a stable Android experience. It does have improved controls, alternative dome switch or conductive rubber. That is that built thing I showed you originally. Better build quality, better heat dissipation with the metal shielding inside the case and it does have that official launcher that you saw on the Retro Pocket 2. But now this is packing Android 11, which has been stated to gain a 20% or even 30% more performance. So I'm quite intrigued to see what we can push out with this new Android version. Personally, the first thing I do like to do with any of these handhelds or even mobile phones is to chuck on the screen protector first before I do anything else, because I have learned the hard way. And I'm not really the best at this, but this seems to be an alright job. I just got a little bit of dirt in the corner, but the screen is still very nice. At the base of the unit, you do have your USB micro C, the headphone jack, and this TF card, which is being protected by this little cover flap, which is a great addition and resembles much like a Nintendo Switch. I do have my custom own 128GB drive, so I can put some more ROMs, especially when you get those CD ISOs. It's a bit of a fiddle to get in originally, but when you got it, it's all good. Now let's boot up this handheld for the first time, just holding the power button on the top. And this did take around about a minute to then boot it into your initial startup screen. Ooh, and here we have it. That's definitely from Donkey Kong, that boot up sound. So it's taken a while just to get its bearings. And then we do have that welcome installation screen, which if you remember from the plus, it is almost copy and paste from that. So R1 to skip, you can select your language, connect to your Wi-Fi. So I'm just going to do that on the side so you don't see my details. Next up is select your time zone. It should automatically find where you are when connected to the Wi-Fi. Then you got Google Play services. I always want to enable them, but a lot of people may not want to include that because that does take up some RAM. Then after that, we got your pre-installed apps that you want to select and include in your installation. I did kind of choose which ones I wanted, but then at the end, I just selected all, so I don't want to miss out on anything else. I'm fine if there's anything new I can play around with later. Now that you've selected everything that you want to include in your pre-install, this did take round about, for me, about five to 10 minutes to get everything up and running. It seems to be a very smooth and simple experience just to set this up. Now we are finally there with the configuration all updated. And let's boot this up for the first time. And it goes straight now into the front end. So nothing is on here. So there's still some setting up needed for this. So bear in mind that you want to have a good half an hour to an hour to get things up and running. I understand people have their own ways of setting up, but I'll just show you an example of how I like to set things up personally. So now I choose the apps I want to add onto the main screen first. Then I head to the emulation tab at the bottom left. To select the systems I want to set up, remember you would have to, of course, add your own ROMs to the SD card and place them onto there first, which I then select. You can then select the path to your ROMs located onto the SD card. This little menu that pops up, I found a bit of a pain just to select the folder, which includes those ROMs I wanted to select for for that system. There's no button to be able to trigger to choose that. You just have to be very precise with your thumb pressing to select that right system. Once selected, the front end will then try and scrape the images and rename the ROMs to the closest allocated naming. This is probably the longest part of your setting up, depending on how many ROMs you got and you, how many systems you want to set up in the first place. I was very familiar with this front end because it is the same as the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. Now, apparently, as stated by the YouTuber Taki Udon, he has had this for quite a while, but was unable to review this due to how many problems were there originally with this device. One of the main things was the battery problem, as this will then hit by 20 or 30 percent. The screen then would have some dire problems. So a lot of these units were kept in storage for almost over a year. But I do recommend checking out this video to get more details. So with this now, I would recommend heading to the Play app and update all these apps because they are quite dated. 
it did state some pretty big news as well which i explained later on in this video so now that you got all your apps updated from the play store one thing i recommend is heading to the retro arc website itself because if you got retro arc from the play store it does cap on its usability so download the 64-bit version that is for android once you've got that unpacked download all the necessary cores of each system you want to set up that does take a while now that you've got them one thing i'd just like to do personally is to disable the overlay controls another is to lower the notification sign because those pop-ups do seem to take up half the screen so i just kind of half that and then i just set up my retro chivos i gotta get them up and running i'm a big fan of that just put in your same account name as password as the one that you use for your main setup to the retro achievements website now i just had to use an interface and appearance and set up the menu to xmb style it just works great with this widescreen setup you will have to reboot the system to then apply it as you can see it does look pretty nice the next thing i do i head to the controller setup and then set up the analog digital to the left analog sticks and then we can use the left analog as well as the d-pad for those games and one last thing i like to do is head to the appearance side and then lower that font size and then this menu can fit more comfortably onto the screen now that retro arc is all set up it does need those bios files to get those cds and some arcade systems to run properly so i plug it into my pc with that usb provided and then set it to file transfer then you can get to the main retro pocket 3 hard drive head to the retro arc folder into the systems and there you can see there's be nothing in your folder but if you drag all those bios files i can't mention where to get them but just drag them all into this folder and then you'll be good to go to use for those systems there's also a controller setup app where you can see your inputs on any of the buttons so if there's any problems with any of this you can then find out this way and so far the input is pretty great and i've had no problem since I do recommend doing this yourself in case you come across your problems with your own order. As we pull down the notification apps, there's quite a lot for us to choose from, which is very nice. So we do have the auto rotate, and we can adjust that if you wanted to use any landscape game with force landscape. We do have aeroplane mode to get rid of Wi-Fi. Then we can actually screencast this to another wireless adapter to a TV, which is pretty great. One thing I'm a bit of fan of is the screen record start. With that, then you can select if you want to record the audio within the game or even with the mic that you can found at the front of this handheld and indicate if any of the touches are pressed on the screen. So I'm pretty fan about that and I will be using that quite a lot. And one good thing is eye comfort. So you can turn that on. So if you want to play this game at night, you're not going to be burning your eyes with the blue screen. So a very nice comfortable factor with this. Later down the line, after carry on with setting up the built-in front end, I came across some very annoying problems. This was just my experience, but scraping images did take longer than I've experienced in the past with the Retro Pocket 2 Plus. The Windows One just did not want to find any of the art, and a couple of systems could just not load the ROMs list that was located and found on the SD card. So I tried my favorite default front end, which is Dig, which is a great app and has not failed me in the past, but this also had some problems by not loading up the 64-bit retro arc that I installed earlier and saving the settings every time it would just reset them. So I had to get rid of that. But also in the timing of making this video, the great YouTuber ETA Prime, I love his work, posted content of a new available front end for Android called Dai Jisho. I bet that's exactly how you pronounce it. Can't blame the man for trying. This I found to work miracles. A great friend N that is hitting the ball out of the park. If you like a setup guide video on this app, just let me know in the comments box below. But so far, I can say if you are having problems as well with the built-in front end, I would just jump straight onto this app. Now with the RP3 having a 16 by 9 screen, I can finally get around on testing this Mega Drive GX widescreen core, which I've been meaning to do for quite a while. And it does work pretty awesome with titles that is compatible. I do recommend giving it a go, but its compatibility is pretty low. There is a SNES widescreen core as well, but that does not run near as good as this one for the RP3. The next feature I want to cover and really enjoy personally is this video output that does have 720p and finally we can now fill that screen. It is a better experience than the RP2 and Plus model. I did find the colouring as well a bit better than the RP2 Plus as well. 
there's just no reason why we can't get a dock mode with this handheld, which is kind of frustrating because we could get a 1080p mode and get a higher resolution. That would be great if they enable this later down the line. When it comes to controllers with the Bluetooth, I hooked up my PlayStation 5 controller with no problems, syncing up straight away. I don't have the necessary equipment to really test for any input lag. With the PS5, I did experience some very minor input lag, nothing that would really spoil the experience of gaming, but I did find this better with less lag than other devices. With its single OTG USB adapter, the RetroBit controllers work really well with this handheld and was a better experience than the PS5 with less lag, but again, nothing too drastic. It's still only compatible with just the one USB input, which is a bit of a shame, so no multiplayer USB controllers could connect. There has always been problems with running multiple controllers, especially using Android OS, so it would be great later down the line to get a dedicated app to get different profiles for different controllers to make sure that these are registered correctly. Again, this was just my experience, so yours could differ. Another feature that this can provide is game streaming. The example I'll show here is to quickly cover the PS Remote Play. The official one that you can download from the Play Store, I personally found does install and boot up completely fine, but it will not register the control buttons. So I had to settle with touchscreen, not exactly what I was after, but there is a third party app called PS Play. This found the control straight away, making this my app to go to for PlayStation streaming. This is connected to my local connection with my PlayStation 5 attached with the ethernet cable, making sure I get the best type of connection. The video quality is set to 720p with high bitrate. There is definitely noticeable lag, but it still holds up and gives you decent gameplay. I could try and lower the quality to improve this input lag. Another addition I thought would be a great idea is hooking up the PlayStation 5 controller via the Bluetooth connection in coherent with this PS Play app. Though it did connect with no issues, there definitely were a lot of problems, especially later down the line. The buttons kept swapping around and the latency was even worse. I best just stick with the controller on the handheld itself is a better experience. Now to cover on a very important part of this first hands-on setup guide review video is the emulation. To sum it up quickly, if you are already used to the performance of the RP2+, Plus, you are getting basically the same results. But now with this updated Android version to number 11, with that extra gigabyte of RAM, if you decide to go for that version, the OS and the app experience like downloading and web browsing and video playing is a much smoother, fluid, responsive experience. Really finally scratching that itch I've been wanting for these handhelds for quite a long time making this a further tolerable experience, especially now I got a touchscreen as my plus model I'd ordered was just the upgrade board. Though the emulation side of things is still the same experience, PSP has good compatibility, still struggles with those more demanding titles, N64 is of course the same experience, but then again, if you had the highest end of powerful handheld, the N64 emulators are still a pain I find. Dreamcast, you can push up the times two resolution, with those less demanding titles as well with the PlayStation 1 and also with that widescreen hack now with this handheld does look pretty sweet. Again, you can get times 2 resolution on the PlayStation 1 but it is only acceptable on a handful of titles. I do recommend using the DuckStation app to get those results. The one main step up that is really getting me hooked onto this handheld is that OLED screen. The colours are now just popping and is a better experience overall than the RP2. Not to say that the RP2 does not have a great screen as well. Though with this comfortable form factor making it the most pocket friendly handheld that I have experienced, there are a couple of essential few things I would just like to mention that I wish they brushed up on before release. Of course this is just my opinion. When it comes to the start and select button, my gaming brain just always results to it being available on the front facing of the handheld. But it did quickly grow me using the start button, it wasn't a problem in that at all, but that select button does have a bit of a reach. The volume dials on the side of this device would have been nicer on the top, and across the other two Retroid Pocket 2, their signatures were to have the analog stick at the top of it, so to have the D-pad on the top now is a little bit different, and it's just not my personal preference. Though the D-pad is very different, and is very comfortable, and is a big step up from the RP2, and plus, 
An LED at the front facing of this device would have been nice just to indicate some charging or just to see if the power is on. Would have been nice just like a lot of these other handles feature anyway. This form factor to me is very smooth and comfy, but I found it has lost a lot of its gaming character that you have in other handhelds. If the casing was a little bit bigger, perhaps some convex moulding around to grip your hands just to give it a bit more style and grip would have been nice. Now as a first impression of this handheld, I know this is pretty awesome and I know a lot of you are going to be happy about this, but I do need some extra time about this and in about a month's time I get a better verdict, but already this has exceeded my expectations. But there are just a couple of things that I did mention previously that would have done this better to my personal taste, but that's just my own opinion. And as always, as I end these videos, thanks for watching. And if you liked it, hit that button. If you want to support this channel, click subscribe, leave the comments below, and I'll catch you a lot on my next video.